to learn, I should say, more about tonight's cop topic. Here's a way to proverbially at least kill two birds. Buy a copy of the book tonight through our local independent partners at Third Place Books using the link on this very page rather than later on through a stateless multinational conglomerate. All right then. Steve Olson is a Seattle-based writer and author of several books. 2016's Eruption, The Untold Story of Mount St. Helens, won the Washington State Book Award and was named one of the best nonfiction books of 2016 by that aforementioned stateless multinational conglomerate. And 2003's Mapping Human History, Genes, Race, and Our Common Origins uh, was nominated for the National Book Award. His work has been featured in Atlantic Monthly, Science, Smithsonian, and other magazines. He's a consultant writer for the National Academy of Sciences and other national scientific organizations. Kathleen Flanagan is a poet and educator in Seattle, and she's the author of three poetry collections, including 2012's Plume, an edition of Nuclear Age Songs of Innocence and Experience, inspired by Hanford. She was also the Washington State Poet Laureate from 2012 to 2014, and she's currently serving on the board of Jack Straw, a local audio art studio and cultural incubator. They're here tonight to talk about Steve's book, The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen Flanagan and Steve Olson. Uh, thanks, Ware. Um, as you noted, Kathleen published a book of poems in uh, 2012, and all of those poems are about Hanford. I actually quote several of those poems in my book that came out just last week, uh, including one at the very beginning of my book that's called A Great Physicist Recalls the Manhattan Project. But for the beginning of this conversation, Kathleen is going to read a poem from her new uh, book of poems, which is entitled Post Romantic and is coming out in October from the University of Washington Press. And partly so that I can make sure that my slides are going to work, I'm gonna project the words of her poem onto my screen so that we can, we can follow along. So there we go. Well, thanks, Steve. I just wanna say before I read the poem, how pleased I am to be part of this evening. I think it's wonderful to celebrate the, the uh, publication of this book. And it means a lot to me personally because, not just because I have poems in it, but because this is a story, the story of Hanford, which is not told as much as I think it should be. And it actually gives me a lot of hope to think that this nationally published, published book, it with a big New York publishing house, will help get the story out. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have is that there's all of this waste that doesn't go away and not enough people that know about it. So. Thank you for your book. I learned all kinds of things from it. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited that it's out there for people to read. And it's a really interesting and, and exciting read too. Okay. Um, so this is a poem, we thought it would be a good place to start because it kind of sets the, sets the tone for our talk tonight. It kind of tells the story, um, one big fell swoop and it's called Story That Won't End Well. It begins in a laboratory under a football field. While the axis rolls over distant continents, 50,000 nomads journey to the American West to construct cathedrals in the desert for Nobel physicists, performing feats they're not privileged to understand, to microscopic tolerances in dust storms, the stuff of legend. Periscopes and code words, train cars loaded with uranium, the heroism of a just war, all prologue to the story we can't see, smell, or taste, that seeps underground and drifts undetected downstream and downwind, while the Soviets match us bomb for bomb, while we build lives and more reactors, pledge allegiance, defend the key, plant birches in the yard, and a naga hide couch in the family room. Our story develops invisibly, incrementally, until one afternoon, it daylights in town square, and we force ourselves to read it bubbling there, the ugly, stinking, bitter truth. And some fall down, and some go home unmoved. So, Steve, it's wonderful to have you here tonight to begin to tell this story. Um, also, I'll hand it over to you. 
Thanks, Kathleen. That is an incredible poem that really does tell the whole story of Hanford. I just love it. I wish it had been available to, to publish in this book. And so, so that's the short version of the Hanford story right there. And I'm going to back up and fill in some of the details. So first of all, where is Hanford? Uh, as you can see in this map uh, on the uh, left-hand corner, it's in South Central Washington State where the Columbia River briefly flows in the wrong direction to the east and then to the north before it ultimately curves around again to the south and below uh, the Tri-Cities, um, it curves west and then flows through the Columbia River Gorge uh, to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so why is Hanford there? Uh, the location was chosen on the first day of winter in the year 1942. A colonel from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers named Franklin Mathias had been sent from Washington, D.C. to look for a place to build a facility that could create the material that was needed to build atomic bombs. So he was flying around various sites in the states of Washington, Oregon, looking at places, and he had just looked at a site in Oregon and was now flying north. And as soon as the small plane that he was in came over the top of the Horse Heaven Hills, uh, he knew he'd found what he was looking for. In this broad, arid plain that stretches from Richland uh, to the bend of the Columbia River up there near White Bluffs. Maybe you can see my cursor up here where White Bluffs is. Uh, Colonel Mathias had a list of requirements that the site had to meet. First of all, it needed cold water to cool the uh, huge nuclear reactors that were going to be built at the site. And the Columbia River could provide plenty of that. It needed electricity to power equipment at the site. And coincidentally, the Grand Coulee Dam had come online just the year before. And a new set of high voltage lines ran right through the site on their way down to Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River. <clears throat> Uh, Matthias needed a rail line to haul equipment and chemicals to the site. And amazingly, the main branch of the old Milwaukee Road Railroad ran right to the north of Saddle Mountains, you can see in this map. And a spur line made its way along the Columbia River, along the west bank of the Columbia River to the town of White Bluffs in the center of the site. So the rail line was already there. He needed the area to be sparsely populated because everyone in this area was going to have to leave. And in 1942, each of these small farming towns of Richland, Hanford, and White Bluffs had about 200 or 250 people living in them. Uh, altogether in this whole area, there were about 1,500 people uh, who would have to move. So Matthias figured that that was a relatively small number that uh, would have to leave their homes. And finally, he needed the site to be far away from any major population centers, which is one reason he was looking in the Western United States, uh, because if anything went wrong with the nuclear reactors or with any of the other facilities on the site, uh, he didn't want too many people to be killed. As I write in my book, if Matthias had looked just to the Northeast of the site he had chosen for Hanford, he would have seen the small town of Othello see it on this map up there on the horizon. That's the town where I grew up in the uh, 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, you can almost uh, see my house uh, uh, from this in this photograph, uh, sort of in this area right here oh, at 915 Elm Street. Uh, just to give you a sense of how things are laid out between Othello and Hanford, my wife and I were hiking a few months ago on the top of Saddle Mountain, and I took this photograph uh, looking back toward Hanford, toward the south. So that little splash of blue in the middle right there is the Columbia River, and you can see tiny specks of white on the other side of the river. Those are the nuclear reactors. So when I was taking this photograph from the top of Saddle Mountain, Othello was directly behind me. That's how close they were. Or here's another way of looking at it. On the cover of my book, Othello is about 15 miles behind these twin smokestacks uh, that are right here that are rising from the power plant of the F reactor. And on the other side of the Columbia River are the White Bluffs, uh, from which the town of White Bluffs got its name. And that ridge in the distance is the Saddle Mountains, the ridge that separated Hanford and from Othello, where I took that previous photograph. Othello, uh, when I was growing up, had about 4,000 people in it. It was a wonderful town to grow up in. Uh, as I wrote in the book, uh, I'll just quote one sentence from the book, in rosy hindsight, I remember Othello as an isolated, self-contained paradise where we were free to make our own mistakes and enjoy our own triumphs. But there was another feeling I had while I was growing up in Othello. Uh, I, I had the sense that this little small town was really in the middle of nowhere. 
And uh, by the time I was in middle school and then in high school, I was just desperate to get out of that town, to go to someplace more exciting. I mean, we would come to Seattle on vacations to watch the Seattle Supersonics play. And it just, it just seemed to me that I wanted to be somewhere closer to the center of the action. And I might say, by the way, that this was a sentiment that my parents encouraged every way they could. Uh, here's an example of their encouragement. Uh, the only problem with this plan is that your children then move far away from you and don't come home for a long time. But uh, 10 years ago, when my wife got a job here in Seattle and we moved back to Seattle from the East Coast where we had lived previously, I started traveling in Eastern Washington and realized in retrospect that Othello wasn't really as isolated as it seemed back in the 1960s and 1970s. Right on the top of Saddle Mountains, between Othello and Hanford was an Air Force station that we called Radar Hill because of this large ray dome that sat on top of this hill. And that Air Force station was there to protect the town of Hanford, uh, just 15 miles away from Othello on the other side of the ridgeline. Now, this was back in the 1960s and 1970s, and we didn't know much about Hanford at that point. Um, I mean, we knew it was involved in the nuclear weapons program. Uh, I was a big science geek uh, in the Sputnik age in the 1960s, uh, interested in science. And so I probably knew at that time that it manufactured uh, plutonium. But Hanford was uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, actually throughout its history since the 1940s, behind uh, tall barbed wire, heavily armed fences. Uh, my grandfather sometimes worked as a steam fitter at Hanford. But when you uh, were an employee at Hanford, you had to sign an agreement that you would not tell even your families about what you did there. Uh, this, uh, this motto, silence means security, was a, a common feature. This, you, you would see this plastered on billboards and on water towers. There's the worker's family in the background, presumably completely ignorant about what it is that uh, that person might be doing at Hanford. And you know, I think the, uh, to some extent, the secrecy that surrounds Hanford, that surrounded Hanford back then, it still surrounds the place today. I mean, Hanford is still a closed site because of what's going on there today, the cleanup effort that's going on. Um, but, uh, but, but you're free to learn everything that you want about Hanford. It's just that this, this air of secrecy s has stuck to it. And I think that's one of the reasons that, as Kathleen said, so, so few people know uh, about its history and what's going on there today. So what is it that happened in Hanford? As I said, uh, Colonel Matthias was looking for a place to build a facility that would uh, manufacture a substance that could be used to make atomic bombs. And this substance was discovered in 1941, about 10 months before Pearl Harbor by these two scientists right here. Actually, it was discovered in this, in this laboratory. Uh, the one on the right in the dark suit is uh, Glenn Seaborg, who at the time uh, in 1941 was a 29 year old chemist at the University of California, Berkeley. That's where this laboratory is located. And he was working with a 23 year old graduate student named Art Wall, who's in the light suit here. And uh, in this laboratory uh, where they're standing, they isolated a new element that they named plutonium. In fact, they're holding in this, uh, in the laboratory here, the, the very first sample of plutonium, which they stored in this cigar box. And they used this sample to make some critical measurements of whether or not plutonium was going to be able to uh, to work in atomic bombs. By the way, this uh, photograph was taken when the laboratory was being designated a National Historic Landmark. Um, even though Seaborg and Wall tried as hard as they could uh, to be careful during their experiments, this laboratory had to be thoroughly scrubbed uh, before this event uh, to reduce the amount of radioactivity that was still present uh, in the countertops and on the floors. Here's how you make plutonium. Seaborg and Wall were doing fundamental research into the properties of heavy elements like uranium. And they discovered that if you add a neutron to the most common isotope of uranium, uh, known as uranium-238, you create an unstable isotope of uranium that decays through this two-step process into, a, into two new elements. First, it decays uh, over the course of a couple of days into this element, neptunium-239. But this isotope is also unstable, and it decays over the course of another couple of days into what's what I've called in this diagram element 94, which Seaborg and Wall named plutonium because it's the next you know, planet out from Uranus and Neptune as Pluto. Uh, 
So plutonium-239, or L what I've called element 94 here, is extremely stable. It, it essentially remains unchanged for thousands of years. Uh, that's why it can be used to build atomic bombs. So Seaborg and Wall discovered plutonium at a critical juncture. Before their discovery, scientists knew about one way to make an atomic bomb using a rare isotope of uranium called uranium-235. But extracting enough of that isotope from uranium ore was going to be a very, they knew at the very beginning of, the, of World War II, it was going to be a very difficult process. Uh, during the Manhattan Project, a huge factory was built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and it worked throughout the war to produce exactly enough uranium-235 for one bomb which was the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. They couldn't have tested that bomb even if they wanted to because they didn't have enough uranium to do so. But the discovery of plutonium in 1941 by Seaborg and Wall gave scientists two ways to make an atomic bomb. Uh, they had shown that plutonium was an even better substance to make atomic bombs than was uranium-235. And if US scientists had two ways to make an atomic bomb, then German scientists had two ways to make a bomb as well. I argue in this book that the Manhattan Project probably would not have occurred if plutonium had not been discovered at exactly the right time because it was going to be so difficult uh, in both the United States and in Germany to produce a bomb using uranium. But when the U.S. scientists realized that the Germans could possibly build a bomb using plutonium, uh, that's when the Manhattan Project started. The whole objective of it was really to produce a bomb that could counter the development of an atomic bomb by Germany. But to build an atomic bomb using plutonium, as seen in this diagram, you, you need lots of neutrons. And to this day, there's only one way to generate lots of neutrons, and that's in a nuclear reactor. So in 1941, uh, nuclear reactors didn't exist. But through an, another amazing coincidence, this man, uh, the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, who had fled Italy in 1938 because his wife was Jewish, uh, was working at Columbia University on a, on a prototype of a nuclear reactor. And when, when scientists and government officials realized that nuclear reactors could be used to produce plutonium, they uh, gave Fermi much more money to do his research. And at the end of 1942, so right before Matthias's flight to pick a site for Hanford, Fermi and a group of scientists, all men except for one woman who you can see in the middle of this painting, um, built, uh, this, uh, built this, the first world's first nuclear reactor under the stands of a football field at uh, the University of Chicago. Now, this is one of the most famous experiments of the 20th century, uh, and it's been written about uh, countless times. But most accounts of this experiment have emphasized that it was designed to prove that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction was possible, that Fermi could do it. And you know, that's true. Uh, Fermi was trying to do that. But at the time, at the end of 1942, he was trying to demonstrate something that was equally important, which is that the nuclear reactors that were then being designed at the University of Chicago uh, to produce plutonium for atomic bombs would work. So less than two years, after Fermi's experiment, this uh, experimental nuclear reactor was built at the University of Chicago. This nuclear reactor uh, on the banks of the Columbia River had been built. This reactor was built in just 11 months from the time they broke foundation to when they began producing plutonium in this reactor. Uh, this is called the B reactor. It's, uh, this is a photograph from World War II. The B reactor is that blocky building uh, between the two water towers. Uh, those water towers contained emergency cooling water in case uh, something went wrong with the reactor. So this reactor was the very first large-scale nuclear reactor built anywhere in the world. Uh, all subsequent reactors have been based on the technologies uh, that were developed here at the B reactor. By the way, uh, some of the people listening to this uh, event may know that the, <clears throat> the B reactor has been preserved by a group of engineers and other people associated with Hanford. Uh, and it's uh, now part of uh, a new national park that was created about five years ago, the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. I've been to all three sites in the park, uh, both at Hanford, uh, there's another site at Los Alamos and another site in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And uh, the, the B reactor is by far the most impressive thing to see in all of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. When you walk into the room, in the front of the reactor, 
and see these 2004 aluminum tubes, which pierce this huge block of graphite, which is what this reactor was made out of. This is where the operators of this reactor would load the uranium fuel cells elements into these tubes uh, where the chain reaction would occur to make plutonium and the, and the fuel cells would then fall out of the back, back of the reactor. I mean, when I walked in and saw this thing, I could not believe it. I just, it just took my breath away that this thing could still exist. And you know, it looks um, almost exactly the same way. It has changed very little since 1944, since Enrico Fermi and other world famous scientists and engineers of the 20th century uh, started this reactor up and began making plutonium in September of, um, of 19, uh, 1944. Uh, I mean, it's an incredible thing. I'd, you know, once this pandemic is over, I would certainly encourage people to uh, book a tour and, and try to go over and see the B reactor. Uh, this was the first of nine reactors nuclear reactors that were eventually built along the left bank of the Columbia River, uh, three during World War II, and then another six during the Cold War, uh, when Hanford made the plutonium that today acts as the trigger for the nuclear weapons in the U.S. nuclear arsenal. That's why I called my book The Apocalypse Factory, actually. It's, it's not so much a reference to the site as it is a reference to what was made at the site, because if the plutonium at Hanford is ever used in our current nuclear weapons, uh, that, that would be the end of human civilization. That, that would be Armageddon. But making plutonium in a nuclear reactor is only the first step in a two-step process. Uh, after you add uh, the neutrons to the uranium and fuel, you need to chemically, chemically extract the plutonium from the fuel elements. And that was done in these immense windowless uh, concrete buildings at Hanford. The workers at Hanford called these Queen Mary's uh, because they were as large as ocean liners. It's just a remarkable sight when you're driving by Hanford to look out in the desert and see these gigantic buildings and uh, rising from the desert. It's, it's really the sight that made me uh, uh, think about writing this book uh, the very first time once I visited Hanford once uh, in 1984 for a magazine story I was doing. So the way this works is essentially you take the irradiated uh, uranium fuel elements out of the nuclear reactors and you put them in one end of this building and from the other end emerges a very tiny dribble of plutonium and that's the material that was used in the very first nuclear explosion that ever occurred at the Trinity test in New Mexico. The 75th anniversary of that was a few weeks ago. And uh, that was also what was the material that was used from this building uh, in the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima used uranium from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. As a byproduct, this manufacturing process generates an, uh, an immense amount of highly toxic chemicals that were used to separate out plutonium from uranium, which were also then rendered extremely radioactive after being used in the processing plants. Now, the builders and operators of Hanford, they figured they had a war to win. They, uh, First World War II and then the Cold War, they, they assumed that subsequent generations could figure out how to deal with all these chemical and radiological wastes that were being generated in this process. So what they did is they pumped the waste uh, into gigantic tanks that were built at Hanford and then covered up with uh, sand and dirt. This slide shows 12 of what eventually became 177 underground tanks at Hanford that were used to store high level waste, high level chemical and radiological waste from the processing plants. And the Department of Energy has made good progress in cleaning up some parts of Hanford, uh, but they're just starting to deal with and process the wastes that have been stored in these tanks for more than 75 years now. It's astonishing to realize that the chemicals used during World War II to generate the plutonium for the Nagasaki bomb are still sitting in these tanks, which had a design life, by the way, of about 20 years. And here we are 75 years into it. I'm going to end with this slide. Uh, this week on Thursday is the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And Sunday, this Sunday is the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki. For my book, I, I spent a week in Nagasaki uh, walking through the city and trying to reconstruct what that nuclear weapon did to the city and to the people who lived in that city. Uh, in, in my book, I followed the experiences of a physician at the Nagasaki University Medical Hospital. He was standing in his office in the middle of these buildings in the foreground of this photograph right here. Uh, 
Uh, he was about a half mile from where the bomb exploded, right above the, uh, above the center, right sort of up in the center of this photograph. Uh, he was standing right by a heavy concrete, there was a heavy concrete wall between him and the explosion, and which, which cut down, reduced significantly the amount of radiation to which he was exposed, although he still suffered from terrible radiation sickness uh, in the weeks and months after the bombing. I had his diary uh, translated from Japanese. I talked with his daughter and granddaughter. There's still a museum to him at the uh, Nagasaki University Medical Hospital. He spent the rest of his life uh, studying the effects of the bomb on the uh, survivors of the bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, as you can see, uh, the valley, the Yurikami Valley, it's a uh, part of Nagasaki was totally destroyed uh, with a, a death toll of between 40,000 and 70,000 people. And by today's standards, this was a very small nuclear weapon. The average nuclear weapon in today's arsenal is uh, 10, 5, 5, 10, 20 times as large as the weapon that was dropped on Nagasaki. I mean, a single, a single hydrogen bomb dropped on uh, Seattle would destroy much of the city. So by the 1970s, the United States had more plutonium than it would ever need. And uh, plutonium production at Hanford was scaled down and then ultimately stopped. And since the 1980s, the focus at Hanford has been cleaning up the environmental contamination left from decades of, of plutonium production. We, we, they, the, there was no longer a need to make any, any plutonium. And so that's where I wanted to bring Kathleen uh, back into this conversation because Kathleen not only grew up in Richland, which was the town that was constructed to house the operators of Hanford, uh, but also worked at Hanford as an environmental engineer. Many of her poems in Plume uh, relate to that experience. And, uh, and I describe Kathleen's experiences at Hanford in, in some detail in my book. So Kathleen, you and I, uh, I, I have a question for you to sort of start, start off this conversation. You and I grew up at just about the same time, just uh, 60 miles away from each other. You were growing up in Richland, the daughter of, um, of a scientist at, who, who worked at Hanford. So what was that like? You have even more direct experience with relatives who worked at the facility than, than I did. Yeah, I, I was thinking about how you said you probably knew by high school or before that they were making plutonium out at the Hanford site. And I honestly do not remember when I figured that out, but I would guess it wasn't until high school. And I know that sounds shocking, but this is a hallmark of the, of the don't talk about it if you don't have a reason to uh, culture of the Tri-Cities and especially Richland. Um, we just did not talk about what we called the area. We didn't talk about it. In fact, we were sort of proud of ourselves. It was a marker of our culture. Um, so, you know, we just, dads would come home and nobody talked about work and that's, you know, kids at school would say, you know, we'd course whisper to each other what could it be and I remember one of the secret ideas was that they were um, there were beagles in cages out there that were being taught to smoke cigarettes that was one of the things I remember hearing um, so I was tardy to learn about plutonium and about that part of it but I eventually figured it out and I knew as a child, you just sort of soak things up. You sort of soak up the idea that this is for the country, for our safety. You know, there's a there's a sort of undercurrent of patriotism that runs through the Hanford site and the communities that support it. So um, we had good schools. We had a very close community. It was a great place to grow up. I think probably not that different than Othello in that regard. Um, it's very hard to describe it from the inside. We were a monoculture. Um, there weren't multiple generations living there. There was just, uh, you know, our parents and there were the kids and um, everybody looked like me, mostly white. Um, a lot of educated, very educated people. My dad had a PhD and then a lot of people that had eighth grade educations and we'd all be living next door to each other and houses that all look the same and alphabet houses. Uh, we call them al alphabet houses. So there was some things about it that I, I really miss and loved that idea of uh, this egalitarian community where nobody talks about work. So there's not somebody's dad is more important than somebody else's. 
We live in houses that look pretty much the same. So there were elements of it that I thought were really ideal and great public schools, um, a lot of emphasis on family life because there was nothing else to do. Uh, most people had families. So there was a lot about it I liked. Did you know what your dad did at Hanford? And did you tell me, and did I forget to put in the book that he actually worked in an office once that Enrico Fermi had worked in? Because I don't think well, I've read the book. Well, that that's the family story. So dad had an office in the 300 area in the only one of the old office buildings and he had the only window in the building. So he thought that that might've been Fermi's office because it had the window. So we he liked to say that that was probably Fermi's <laughs> office, but we didn't know for sure. That's a, that, that sounds like a good theory to me. So yeah. then you went to the University of, I mean, you went to Washington State University mm -hmm. and studied environmental engineering. And how did that come about? Was that, was that because of growing up at a site, which by that time was just starting to transition away from production to cleanup, to dealing with all these environmental wastes? Well, it hadn't transitioned yet. Oh, it hadn't, okay. Uh, no, um, I, I took the only job in 1983 after graduating in civil engineering that I could find. I found a sure thing at Hanford. And the job market then, even for engineers, was really poor that year. So I took the thing I knew and I, I took a job with Rockwell out at Hanford and I worked in the 200 areas. So when you talked about being driven past the separations plants in 1984, mm -hmm. I was there in one of those trailers nearby uh, working my first year as an engineer out at Hanford. I, I didn't know that. Yes, you would, have been, you would have been in that very same place. And what was that like? You know, um, Hanford was, it was designed by scientists and engineers, but the uh, the operators and the people who built Hanford made very important contributions to the plant in that so much had to be sort of invented from scratch in building the world's first nuclear reactors. And they were convinced that they were the people who sort of knew the plant best mm -hmm. and knew how to get it to operate. And, and not a lot of that necessarily was written down. I mean, they had spent decades working on that plant and knew it from the inside out and knew all of its quirks. All of a sudden, and so there must have been generational issues and maybe gender issues involved with you coming into the plant and all of a sudden ask, starting to ask them questions. Uh, definitely. There, uh, I didn't work in manufacturing. I worked in uh, monitoring. So we were in doing environmental monitoring of the groundwater, um, surface water, um, and we measured the movement of groundwater towards the river. So we were in the environmental group. So there's, there's that sort of separated us out. And um, I did have to do a water balance, which you talk about in the book. Uh, it was a, an attempt to figure out where the water's coming in and where it's going out. And there was a difference between the two numbers. And I was trying to figure that out. But so I would be calling these old guys um, and they were not very receptive. I mean, there, and there's a lot of things working against me. There's the idea, the culture of um, need to know, you know, why did I need to know that? They were suspicious right from the very beginning. There's that. And then there's the idea that there's this girl on the phone and it's not really, you know, it's 1985 or whatever. And there, I didn't have a lot of authority at the, at the time. So I look back on it, I think there was, you know, problems around that. But I also am very respectful of the way they kept everything running. Whatever you will say about whether the plants should have been operating, what they did, the Cold War, politics aside, it was quite a marvel. And one of the things I love in your book is the way you talk about the, the, the difference between the scientists and the engineers. And there was, there was some friction there. I thought you captured that really well. And I'd love it if you would tell the story of the, uh, the number of aluminum tubes that they needed to make the. the oh, that's right. The aluminum tubes. Yes. Yeah. Because it was, it's the famous story about the, uh, when Enrico Fermi was there starting up the reactor, everything worked fine. It was September of 1944 and they got the reactor up to the power that they wanted to. And all of a sudden the reactor started losing power and nobody could figure out what was going on. All these, uh, the reactor and uh, Hanford uh, during World War II was built by DuPont and many of the DuPont engineers and executives were there in the room. Uh, 
as one observer said, uh, smelling of good whiskey at the time that the uh, radiator that the nuclear reactor was going to be started up. And all of a sudden, this disaster started happening, where the reactor starts losing power, and nobody knows uh, what's going on. And uh, so all the scientists get to work, and they say, well, there's got to be something in the reactor that is soaking up neutrons. And so as we start up the neutrons, um, uranium atoms are splitting, it's creating something, uh, and it's just soaking up these neutrons like a sponge. It turned out to be xenon, 135, but at that time, nobody knew that that was a possibility. So now, they, they, they looked at this reactor and thought, this, this entire thing could fail. I mean, we've built all the, these reactors and, uh, and we didn't anticipate this problem. It could very well be that all of the money that we've spent on this uh, was wasted and that we're never going to be able to generate plutonium here and that we're at the end of World War II only going to have one bomb made out of uranium because we've just wasted all this money on plutonium. General Groves, Leslie Groves, the man who ran the Manhattan Project, I think almost had a heart attack when he heard about the reactors uh, uh, not working in time. Okay. But you know, the engineers at DuPont, they have a... They like to build in these margins of safety, as engineers always do. They're just taught that in school. If you, you know, design it for, for these specifications, but then add 25% just in case something goes wrong and you need it. And in this case, they had done that. They had, a, instead of uh, building the reactor with only 1,500 of those aluminum tubes, which is what the scientists had called for in their design, the engineers said, oh, we're going to build 2,000. We, we want to have some, some in, extra in there. And the, and the scientists complained bitterly. They said, you know, we've got to get this bomb done. We're, we're in a race with the Germans right now. And if we don't get this plutonium made, we're going to lose this race. And the engineer said, sorry, we're the ones in charge of the reactor. We're going to build the 2,000. We're going to put 2,000 tubes in there. Well, the only way they were able to overcome this xenon poisoning problem was by loading up the extra 500 tubes that they had put in there as a, um, as a safety margin, just in case the scientists got something messed up. And there's this poem that ran around DuPont for decades after that about how the engineers had saved the scientists bacon essentially by uh, by building in these extra process tubes at the reactor and I'm sure that story is told uh, when you go and see the B reactor there um, you know some of the displays the B reactor was preserved by a, a group of engineers who had worked on the reactors over the years and and realized the significance of this structure as a as a technological achievement for the 20th century. And you know, I'm, I'm very, some controversy about whether the Manhattan Project should be a historical park, uh, what, it, because it can lend, can tend to lend um, an air of celebration to something that ultimately uh, resulted in the production of these nuclear weapons that killed hundreds of thousands of people in Japan and that threaten human civilization today. But the B reactor really offers us an opportunity, I think, to go there and learn about this episode of human history and to become aware of the capabilities that are out there and these nuclear weapons. I mean, people here in Seattle don't realize. I look out the window of my place here in Seattle toward the Olympics over there, and you know, halfway between me and the Olympics is uh, Naval Base Kitsap, uh, the West Coast uh, base for our nuclear submarines. And they have a stockpile of, uh, the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the United States is just 20 miles Northwest of Seattle. And, um, you know, we worry about climate change, but uh, the fact of the matter is uh, we could destroy human civilization uh, in an afternoon if those weapons were ever used. Hey, we're getting some some questions here. And so um, we were supposed to encourage you to ask some questions in the ask a question tab. So we're going to take a look at those. Ah, that first one is a really interesting one. Kathleen, I think we can both take a hack at this. Do you mm -hmm. think this is a question from James. Do you think Hanford would have taken as many risks with exposing people downwind if the managers were not protected by the secrecy, yes, that surrounded the plant? Reconstructing that Cold War mentality about the decisions that were made. I showed you, uh, I'm not gonna pull my slides back up, but uh, both the reactor and the uh, processing plants, the chemical separation plants have these big smokestacks uh, that are right next to them. And in both of these processes of running the reactor and of separating plutonium from the uranium fuel cells, uh, you generate radioactive compounds that are gaseous. You can't keep them in the plant. They would just put them up the stacks and, uh, and hope that the wind was blowing hard and would disperse these materials so that they would not be too concentrated downwind. I've looked hard through the materials at Hanford 
to try to find some evidence that the managers of Hanford during the 50s and 60s knew that they were releasing what at that time would have been termed dangerous amounts of radioactivity. And I, I have had trouble finding any kind of any kind of evidence that they did so. In other words, they had certain standards that beyond which they didn't want to go in releasing radioactivity. And we may quibble with those standards, and those standards may be stricter today than they were then. But I, I personally believe that the operators of Hanford thought that they were not releasing enough radioactivity to cause widespread health problems in the surrounding population. Kathleen, you, uh, I'm a downwinder. You're a downwinder. Uh, we were there during the times of operation. What, what, what do you think about that issue? Well, I, I would maybe rephrase the question, I think, a little bit, which I don't think necessarily the managers, although I think that's very possible that the upper management would hide behind secrecy. I think that's very possible. I think in some ways I'm more interested in the people that, you know, the, the regular Joes that are, that are down working in the plants. Um, and I, I agree with you. I don't think in some ways, I think that people weren't very knowledgeable about environmental releases. The people who did know would be the environmental monitors and they knew and they would report all their figures to my favorite Shakespearean character, which is Herbert Parker uh, from Hanford. And he definitely knew all of this stuff and he kept it all, he, he did not let this be known. In fact, he even lied to Congress. I've seen things written down that prove that he lied to Congress about numbers. Um, but I think he was a very paternalistic person and thought he was protecting the ignorant masses from stuff that they didn't understand, science they didn't understand. And there's always been that element. You don't understand this. This is too sophisticated for you. You know, you're the great unwashed. We, the scientists, will take care of you. And that's part of the, the culture of the time. And it was also very, a very heavily part of that scientific community at the time. So it, it's a mix. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, let's let's keep talking about this because there's another question here that relates directly to this issue, and and I'm really interested in hearing your your answer to this one. It says, Kathleen, you talk about the pride of growing up near the area, and that made me think of the very different reaction by people who lived in places like Nevada, where a lot of the bombs were tested. They were not proud to be living there, and suffered from the fallout both physically and grew up with a deep mistrust in government. Mm -hmm. I wonder, have you or Steve looked into the stories on the other side of the machine? so to speak. And, and I do tell a variety of down winter stories in my, uh, in my book. And there's a, a, a great book by a woman named Trisha Pritikin uh, that just came out a couple of months ago called Hanford Downwinders. And she presents uh, the evidence and the history of the people who were affected by, uh, by some of these releases uh, very, in very compelling fashion. But that's an interesting question because um, though I haven't really been down to Nevada or some of the other sites that surround nuclear facilities from the Cold War. Is, do you think there is a different attitude in Richland than in some of these other n towns affected by nuclear facilities? Well, I, I'm i not a, an expert on some of these other communities. I mean, I've read Terry Tempest Williams and I've, you know, I've read a little bit about the long-term storage that they tried to build and so little bits, but um, I think that Richland is, different. Um, they've always wanted these things. They've wanted the long-term storage. They tried to get it. I mean, there's there's something, they run a little bit counter to what you would expect. Uh, there There is this strange community pride. There's a lot of tribalism. There's a lot of us versus the rest of the world. And and so much of, the, of that community's identity and also their feeling for economic safety is around taking what nobody else wants. And I can't explain it, um, but it's, I think it does run counter to what you would expect. And it runs counter to some of these other communities that were very definitely uh, victims of what was going on around them. And I don't, I've never felt that sense of victimhood in the people who work at Hanford except when it becomes personal. If somebody becomes an, you know, ill 
then you start to see that breaking off. But in terms of the general we, I think it's it doesn't run that way. Right, and I talk in my book about some of the illnesses, including uh, illnesses among family members of people you and I know uh, in the Tri-Cities and, and people I know in Othello as well. I'm gonna answer a question uh, which oddly enough relates to this one, although it's a bit of a tangential story in the Manhattan Project. Apologies if this has already been covered, says Kevin Rang, but can you talk about the non-zero possibility understood at the time that nuclear weapons would instigate a chain reaction in the atmosphere and destroy the planet? Mm -hmm. And yes, it's very interesting. This was a concern at the very first test of a nuclear weapon in New Mexico, the Trinity test using plutonium from Hanford. This uh, ha has been written about um, and studied. Uh, scientists had calculated at that time that the risk was very low, very low, but they couldn't prove that the risk was zero. And therefore, were scientists justified in testing a weapon that had a non-zero possibility of destroying the planet, even if that even if that risk was very low? Now, at the t at the time, they sort of made fun of it. I mean, at the Trinity test, Enrico Fermi was there, and he uh, started taking bets uh, as the time of the test approached on whether or not um, the uh, the the nuclear weapon being tested, the Trinity test, would. Uh, set the atmosphere on fire, and if it did so, whether it would just destroy New Mexico or whether it would destroy the entire planet. And uh, that made Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, extremely irritated at Fermi because he thought everyone was keyed up already and didn't want Fermi taking bets on whether or not the planet was going to be destroyed. The scientists tended to treat it as a joke, but uh, people have looked back at that episode and said, gosh, were we justified in taking those risks? And the reason I bring that particular issue up is because in the 1950s and the 1960s, when we were living there, there was a lot of sentiment that these, and there was sentiment among the scientists working on the facility as well, that we're in a, in a very serious situation and these risks need to be taken. They are justified. And there's still some of that mentality that occurs out at Hanford with people who volunteer for projects in which they're going to get a very high dose of radiation, which uh, you, you know they'll, they'll only get that high dose for a short period of time. Nevertheless, they are increasing their risks of health benefits. Do you remember that mentality back in the 50s and 60s? I remember when there were people like me who would go down to Hanford and be jumpers, people who would be hired to go into a highly radioactive con uh, environment, uh, perform a specific task for a very short period of time, and then you were done. And you could make all kinds of money if you didn't mind being exposed to radiation at high levels for this short period of time. What do you think, Kathleen? Do you know know anybody in the Tri City who's who uh, who was a jumper? Well, I've, I actually have never heard that expression before. Oh, You're yeah, teaching yeah. me all kinds of things. Um, I do know that my friend Carol and her dad, who is a major character in the poems in my book Plume, he to you know he didn't make a lot of money. He had three kids and a wife, and um, I know that he sometimes would do under the table jobs where. You know, he actually would take off his dosimeter, run in, run out, um, mm -hmm. do that kind of work, which is really scary. Um, and he'd get paid under the table. So I know there were people who did that kind of work, but it was never, it was never written up. It was never, you know, official. So people yeah. will do things for money if they have exactly. to. Yeah, yeah. They, they, people don't always didn't always follow the rules back then. Oh gosh, now we only have another seven minutes, and we're getting all kinds of interesting questions which we're going to have to uh, probably not give enough, enough attention to uh, that they deserve. Can I ask you a quick question oh, just sure. about, um, I, I really would like to know why you think that the Hanford story of all the Manhattan Project stories, Los Alamos, um, you know, Oak Ridge, why Hanford and also why Nagasaki, the bomb drop on Nagasaki get kind of pushed aside for some of the other, for Hiroshima and especially for Los Alamos. It's odd. And I think it has to do with the secrecy that surrounded Hanford for so long, even during the Cold War. I mean, at that point, uh, people knew more about Oak Ridge and places like Los Alamos where a national laboratory formed up than they did know about Hanford. Uh, some of it's just timing. The Hiroshima bomb was first. Um, uh, but it is mysterious, as I say at the very beginning of my book, because I, I make the case in this book that Hanford is really the most important place uh, in the history of the nuclear age. The development of, of large-scale nuclear reactors, uh, 
that occurred there, uh, the production of this new element on a large scale, uh, the, the, the development of uh, the material that now serves as the trigger for our nuclear weapons and the rapid expansion of Hanford during the Cold War. Uh, there were all kinds of things that happened at Hanford that really have not gotten the attention they deserve. There's been many, many books written about the Manhattan Project. And um, one of the things that excited me about writing this book was that I would actually be able to talk about things that hadn't been written about in, in popular books before. That, you know, they, they had been in academic papers and people had considered these things, but there really hadn't been a, a popular book written about Hanford that talked about some of these things. Yeah. Um, do we dare uh, address uh, some of the uh, some of the, the some of the hard issues? Um, well, there is this uh, one question. A comment uh, got came up to the top, and I, I think it would be great to at least mention it. Um, uh, Thursday, eight six is the seventy fifth anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. The annual Seattle commemoration of this event will be virtual this Thursday with a video about the thirty five years of this iconic Seattle event available on YouTube. And they're asking us to encourage everyone to watch it and to remember the run out of out of our Washington State production of plutonium, which was a critical and essential element of atomic bombs and which still threaten our existence. Absolutely. I'm speaking myself at the uh, 75th anniversary commemoration on Sunday about my right. research in Nagasaki and also about the Fizzle Material Cutoff Treaty, an effort to uh, eliminate nuclear weapons by uh, monitoring and eventually eliminating the materials that you can use to build nuclear weapons, which is plutonium and uranium-235. I, I just want to say that I love the way that you have you write your books is you usually follow the history through characters. And I think that's just so effective in this book. Um, I learned a great deal about uh, Glenn Seaborg and Leslie Groves, and I didn't know the story um, of Reisuki Shirabi, the the um, the physician in Nagasaki. I think that part of the book is so moving oh, thank because you. it's told through his eyes, and you know he lost two sons, and you know it's it's a and it's a harrowing story. So I think one of the real pleasures of this book is it's even though it's a huge story, it's told on a human scale. And I think you do a beautiful job with well, that. That's very nice of you. As you know, these characters themselves are so interesting. Uh, they're human stories. Uh, even these scientists find themselves facing these immense moral quandaries where uh, the results of basic research all of a sudden uh, make it apparent that these atomic weapons can be built. How do you respond? Uh, do you contribute? Uh, do you walk away? And there were scientists that made that decision to not participate in the Manhattan Project. Uh, there's a, it's also the case that scientists, including Glenn Seaborg, were at the forefront of, uh, of groups who were urging the US government not to drop the bomb on cities in Japan, but to uh, have a demonstration uh, project or to make it apparent uh, to the Japanese uh, that uh, we had mastered this weapon. Uh, their arguments uh, were not, in some cases, they weren't even listened to at the time. Mm -hmm. And yet we look back at those arguments today in retrospect and say, boy, if only people would have paid more attention to those arguments, even if the bombs had been used, perhaps a second one would have been dropped or they would have used them in a, in a different way. Uh, it could have had a big influence on the way that the Cold War developed and on uh, events after World War II. So um, it's, it's not just a story of scientific achievement. It's also a story of people really grappling with some of these demons that arise as you, as you make uh, these scientific discoveries. That's exactly right, yeah. And you don't stop it at the end of the war, which is where everyone in Richland wants to stop the, stop the story. If you ask an old timer to tell the story, it always ends on August 9th. 1945 with a big hooray and and we all know that that isn't even beginning to tell the story it really starts there of course because yeah there were only those three reactors that were built during world war ii and there were another six that were built subsequently to that i think a lot of people in washington state don't realize that washington's one operating power nuclear reactor is uh, at the hanford site just south of the of the the uh, now cocooned reactors uh, that were used to make plutonium. So uh, 
that, that there's a lot about that site that remains relatively unknown. Well, this has been great, Steve. It has been fun. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for uh, for doing this with me. It's 30 and I saw someone starting to appear there, but they seem to have faded back into the background. But nope, there's Candace. Hi. I uh, just wanted to pop back in and thank you both so much for this talk. It's very fascinating. Um, my father works at West Valley Nuclear Site in Western New York. Um, he's worked there for probably 30 years, so I always find this conversation to be very interesting. Um, and thank you all for watching. If you're interested in more Town Hall content, you can follow our Crowdcast channel by clicking the follow button in the top right corner. I want to encourage you to purchase a copy of Steve's book uh, through the Buy the Book button. That's going to take you to Third Place Books uh, website. We can purchase it through them. Um, thank you both again so much. Really fascinating. Um, and I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Thank you.